exactly uh, feel it in my body, like uh, not exactly chilled, but uh, maybe alive, I would say. Like, uh, yeah, there's something very precious happening. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, partly, uh, partly, Carl, because you suggested bringing in a question, you came up with this uh, idea. And uh, so the question itself is so intriguing. And uh, just a few answers we, um, we gathered, you know, we shared, we put in common. There's so much uh, intelligence. And anyway, I think I definitely could recognize myself in uh, part of um, every answer, you know. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of knowledge in this room. And... Uh, and it's beautiful. I think we could put so much uh, intelligence together about the, the you know, this uh, topic that um, you know somebody who lived two thousand six hundred years ago, um, when uh, Europe was still in uh, pre prehistory, you know. 2,600 years ago, somebody in Asia, in a very, very advanced culture, was uh, doing a lot of research around this, around the, the difficulties uh, in the relationship with the sense of self. Uh, and so, uh, so it's been part of uh, human exploration for a long time to reflect the predicament of uh, selfing, the beauties, the potential, and the predicaments of it. And so that's a thing I was thinking, I've been thinking about for a number of years, but um, this week more maybe in some ways, and this afternoon I was like, oh, I want to bring this to the queer group to see what, uh, what we can do with this. Is there something in there for us? Uh, you know, and, and specifically, as I'm you know, yeah, joys and dangers of the selfing for queer folks. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. And um, so I'm willing to share a few thoughts, um, but uh, I think when it comes to um, queer communities, I think we, uh, we have such a queer dharma knowledge to develop that it'll take every one of us to to pitch in you know to to create the you know the the imagery the, the subtlety the nuances the specificities and so that we can share with the rest of the queer people alive now and to come and the rest of the population at large which could benefit a lot from our singular or plural point of view, a very particular special power point of view. Um, and I wonder, I think we could maybe sit together, practice sit, sit as a, a quick way to talk about meditation. We could meditate together in whatever posture feels uh, supportive for you for a few minutes, what would be a good amount of time, Coral? Maybe a 20 minutes be good. Yeah. And uh, of course, just one moment at a time. And um, maybe I'll just say a few words as a, maybe a, that's the aim, the intention as inspiration or maybe contextualizing. It can be good to review a little bit what could be practice. And so one way to understand it, I think, is, um, is about just being, just being. One of us was saying, you know, like uh, you know, the sense of maybe not being enough, not being some, something like this I heard in one of the first uh, shares. And so in meditation, the kind of stance is uh, is uh, maybe just an honoring 
in honoring of being. Something quite remarkable is happening in this uh, consciousness, this capacity to be touched, to, to experience, to feel stuff, to feel, uh, to hear, to see, to, to experience embodiment, to uh, sensitivity to beauty, to meaning, The sensitive, the sensitivity, but um, also what comes with being is the creation, creation of uh, understanding, creation of world, creation, creation of sense. So that's what's happening in the human being uh, all the time. And so meditation is just discovering this as it's happening. It's always kind of some kind of creation reception creation that is happening it's happening now and the body is breathing for example that's something that is very natural and there might be the creation of a i am breathing that we might become aware of it's not just like this expansion and contraction it's a, it's a world creation, a sense of me sitting, meditating, and it might come and go. Me and my sofa, me and my apartment, me and my life, me and my life that sucks, me and my beautiful life. There's some in my body and so yes there are sounds there are sensations and there often is a, a sense that emerges it's very natural it happens almost all the time So we're just discovering this as it's happening. It's very natural. sensitivity to temperature, to gravity. Sensitivity to the aliveness of the body, tingling, hot, cold. Sensitivity to the movement of the body, expansions and contractions of the breath. discover this as it's happening, this sensitivity, this cognition, con consciousness happening. And 
will notice that sometimes the mind has a lot to say. Sometimes it doesn't have much to say. It's listening, being receptive. Sometimes human beings are tired. Sometimes they're maybe relaxed. And they experience uh, discomfort or ease. Sometimes the heart is uh, contracted, sometimes light. Sometimes neutral, anything else. invited uh, to let go of the storytelling, the storyline, where I was and where I'm going and how I get there. We're invited for a few moments to drop this, if possible, to just discover what it is to be just now, to be sensitive. Sometimes such a beautiful thing, sometimes such a difficult thing. But it's happening all the time. This sensitivity, this having senses. So just staying here, we're not departing in 
waiter and back then. Let's see if we can just stay here, discovering human nature, discovering what it is to be ourselves and what it is to be a human being as it's happening. Sometimes it's possible to do this, to just be here with this sensitive uh, body, this sensitive heart. Uh, sometimes we can do this uh, with uh, friendliness, benevolence. Sometimes with uh, joy, appreciation of this sensitivity. Sometimes we do it with maybe patience or tenderness, lots of compassion, because it's not easy. Sometimes we just do it with quietness and curiosity. heard another queer teacher say mindfulness is discovering the familiar. Discovering the familiar. We all know what it is to be sitting or lying down or standing, breathing. To be cognizant be sensitive. We all know this. It's happening all the time. But here we take a moment to really discover this as it's happening. What it's like to breathe or hear.
Just stay here, just a few more moments with this sensitive body, with this sensitive being. And if you want, if your eyes are closed, I would invite you to continue exploring presence with eyes open as you maybe see the screen or see uh, the room. Just see if it's possible to be aware of being, even with what is the dominant sense for many of us. Is it possible to Feel the body breathing with eyes open. To be aware of this cognition that is happening, this kind of registering and revealing, experiencing that is happening. This knowing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, so I'll say a few words of, about uh, this practice and the Dharma and uh, see what resonates, uh, what, what um, comes up for you, what nuances or objections or questions arise in you, clarity, uh, recognition or non-recognition. And, uh, and, and um, thank you also for uh, trusting me or putting at least initial trust in this white cis French Canadian Buddhist teacher. Uh, Yeah, these are just a few ideas for reflection. Um, you don't have to take any, any of this as a truth, but just kind of matter for reflections, uh, if it's helpful. And maybe also as a jumping board for a, a conversation uh, later before we finish. But I'd certainly like to hear more of your points of views. Maybe I'll just say that uh, there is this teaching that you might have heard uh, where uh, the human experience uh, is described uh, as compared to a house with um, six doors and windows always open. So I've heard this many, many years ago. I was very intrigued by this. So it's saying that, um, you know, when you're a human being, if you have sight, uh, then you'll see things all the time. There'll be things being seen, things that uh, are beautiful maybe to see or difficult to see. And 
same thing if the ear is uh, healthy, then the do that door is open. There'll be uh, constantly uh, things being heard, things we want to hear, things we don't want to hear. Same thing with uh, taste, smell, and touch. You know, if we have sensitivity um, to the body, you know, touch, then it means we're going to feel a whole bunch of things. You know, some things may be agreeable, very agreeable, orgasmic, as you could say, and some other things are painful. And uh, in Buddhist psychology, I think, as you might know, there's six senses. There's then the, the other sense of the heart, mind. So what encounters, um, you know, emotions and ideas and associations of mind and memories and creativity, the creation, the different creations in, in that field too. You know, the, if you have a mind, you know, all kinds of things are going to happen in there. And some will be, you know... Uh, liberating and healing and beautiful and meaningful and rich and deep and and other things will be clearly uh, being felt and the mind heart will be very disturbing uh, difficult to experience emotions and thoughts and so that's the human predicament these six doors and windows always open and so there's always and i remember hearing this and it was like very poignant to me to hear it's like wow, that's one take on the whole thing, but it's, it's actually it's touching something. I recognize this. It's not easy. And so part of meditation for me is to kind of learn, become, witness this, become, you know, experience this for what it is, you know, and learn how to, how to meet this, how to experience this, you know, because there's ways that... Uh, this can be, uh, you know, creating a lot of suffering for us. And there might be ways, ways of wisdom, ways of compassion, ways of uh, benevolence, friendliness, you know, that uh, can really help us along the way experience this uh, constant, uh, I, I still have to look this word up. I should have looked 20 years ago, but it's still on my agenda <laughs> to look. But what I've heard was uh, this verb impingement, constant impingement. I don't think it, it doesn't sound like good news. You know, constant impingement, like we're stu constantly being touched. And it's a difficult thing for a human being. And partly what I like about uh, meditation is, um, and that's what my teachers, I'm very grateful to them for having taught me this, is that when I sit, I meditate, what I discover, it could be understood as discoveries about myself that holds, that's a, that's a view that is possible. But there's also another view that is possible that uh, might, might be wise and healing, at least uh, some of the time, is to uh, discover that what we're, or, or the angle is to understand maybe that what we're experiencing as we're meditating is something a little larger than the self. It could stop there. Yeah, it's about me, my breath, my ache, in my lower back, my agitation, my this and that, or my quietness, tenderness. But there's another view where we open up a little bigger. And, uh, you know, as we practice, then we discover human nature. So it's a little wider. And somehow this resonates a lot with me. I, I like to sit and get out a little bit of that view of about Pascal, referring back to Pascal, you know, if uh, like anything that would be happening would mean something or define a certain Pascal or be uh, to compare with the other Pascal that should be or something like this, you know, but in this case here, me, maybe I'll take, say me as the kind of unit of measure, constant unit of measure, everything being measured by what it means about a certain me. And yeah, for me, thank you to my teachers, this invitation to open up a little bit and have a different view, a different vista. And uh, the way I experience it 
is a kind of falling back in humanity. There's a falling in the heart of humanity. And I think it has a particular maybe significance for queer folks, you know, when maybe we've been kind of pushed, pushed to the margins, mar margins, yeah. Uh, maybe that message that we don't belong, that we've internalized, you know, and that kind of counter thing for me, which is discovering human nature and discovering that this is absolutely human nature. It's actually impossible to, in that view, to fall off human nature. Anything that would cross this despair, rage, confusion, uh, anything, arrogance, self-loathing, you know, is uh, very much a human experience. It's very much human nature, nature uh, happening. And so that's something I like about meditation. It's not so much technique, huh? how to put attention to breath or this or that. It's, uh, it's more about view. It's a different view of what's happening. And, uh, you know, in terms of like self-hatred, for example, you know, like before I had the sense that I was, I was stuck with myself, you know, 24 seven, <laughs> then for the rest of my life, you know, kind of stuck with myself. And that's been really helpful to me to discover, oh, actually, no, what is happening is nature, nature or human nature. It's so much bigger. Like I can take a break from the Pascal obsessive view, you know, of everything referring to Pascal in fear and in, you know, fascination and in, in kind of in the cage like uh, experience for me. And suddenly there's just like tingling, heat, digestion, uh, longing, solitude, shame, joy, uh, creativity, uh, elation, uh, you know, bliss, falling apart, you know, like all these things are things that have been happening for, to, for human beings uh, in the past and will be happening also in the future for human beings. And this to me is, uh, has a taste of, uh, brings a sense of freedom, a kind of release from a kind of a cage that I can uh, feel uh, kind of, uh, yeah, caught in, kind of preoccupied, always preoccupied, under occupation uh, with notions of self, you know, who am I, will I get there, do I deserve it, what's my value, you know, things like this. I don't know if you experience any of this, even a third of this, even a tenth of this is already a lot of suffering. And of course, it's not the only way to hold self, you know, there can be, you know, self-love and pride and you know, beautiful self-definition, but there's also, and that's what the early, the first question was pointing to the, 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 the entanglement, the challenges, the disadvantages, the tricky word, but I'll use it because it's in the teaching, so you'll do what you want with it, but the kind of the, the dangers of selfing, of the, the difficult side of uh, selfing, self-obsessing, and the Buddha uh, has done a lot of research around this and a lot of his discoveries and a lot of his teaching is around that, how to hold, how to hold this kind of view of self with care, with, you know, that it maybe be a vehicle, like when we do metta and our loving kindness, like that it can be a, a mode of transportation, a channel for love, you know, for encounter for healing, but how also the same um, kind of way of conceptualize or creating the world or thinking of the world self can also be very detrimental to our well-being, to our liberation. And uh, I think there's a lifetime of exploration about around this, but I'll just name a few things that stand out in the teaching, stand out for me, maybe for you, Delia. And um, one of them is the, um, what is called sometime um, um, in English, it's uh, becoming, becoming. And so 
you know that's a, a small little thing that happens very often in the mind check this out is that true for you when we keep projecting ourselves a little further along you know later when i've done this call when i've done this email when i've done that project when i've uh, done the laundry the, the dishwasher when i've found out who i really am what's my life purpose you know like this this belief that this the other self a little bit further along is the one that has value and it's uh, to me it's remarkable that one can live a whole day believing in a future self you know it could be like later when i've accomplished something big but it can also be very immediate like when the bus arrives you know when i'm at my subway station and this way of kind of postponing life postponing being postponing giving value to being to a later being that will be you know when dinner is done you know when the kid is in bed when the do you recognize any of this it's it can be very subtle very kind of daily very very immediate you know and that's something that we can uh, maybe we can be aware of track be curious about not judgmental or anything but just to say oh voila i'm doing it right now i'm creating this kind of gap this lack there cannot be fullness because it's later when i'm i've arrived to my destination this morning or this or that and that in there there's something very i think it's very sad and i've heard people when they recognize this really for what it is they'll experience some kind of grief you know like wow i've been under the spell of this so much you know like i've been postponing fullness being you know uh, so this kind of delusion is something to check out one thing also that can occupy our mind in the way of selfing is the is the kind of the timeline the narration the description and you know, we can live a lot of life thinking about me, uh, telling the story of me, I was here, I'm going there, will I get there? And giving very f little time to actually being. Do you see the difference between like the, the story of a certain t self on a timeline? I was there, I'm going there. So all these are, um, in French, we would say vase communicant. It's a really good expression. I haven't found the equivalent in English. It's probably exists, but it means that everything I'm, the different point I'm going to make, they relate to each other, they touch each other, they, they, they're not totally isolated, but still in the teaching, there is something about this, you know, uh, fascination for, uh, for timeline. Uh, and like, it takes a lot of energy constantly telling the story of a certain self, you know, I was there, I was raised in that family, this happened, that happened, and later, will this happen? Will that happen? Will I get there? And so this, uh, and part of what meditation does is kind of put the ax in this, at least momentarily. It's not that we have to never return to it, but lose maybe some of the obsession about it could be useful to gain some balance, be freed from that kind of timeline to be able to actually experience this and take care of what's here, you know, maybe appreciate what's here or accompany what is here. And often we're like, oh, later, if this happened, what will I do? What will I do? And we're obsessed about this thing that is kind of in front of us. And uh, the movement of meditation is to actually turn and see, how is this being here? How is this being here right now? And if we find that this being is troubled, then maybe there's a doorway, a gate that can open to self-compassion, compassion, to tenderness. Oh, not easy being here right now. Or, oh, it's actually okay here right now. The threat seems to be later, later. Like maybe it's possible to let go of the storyline and appreciate what is happening here. It's a practice. It's not, uh, you know, sometimes we hear this and it sounds like, Oh, let go of your fascination for your thoughts and just be here and appreciate what's here. Appreciating what's here, I found for myself that it's actually a practice. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a tuning in again and again and letting uh, what is uh, beautiful or reassuring, appe appeasing, if that's a word in English, 
of bringing some kind of peace or, uh, is, is an art, it's, it's an, an, an exploration. So that's one thing. Another thing that goes even further, should I go there? The Buddha went really far, really, really far. These teachings sometimes are uh, presented as counterintuitive, the deepest, most uh, subtle teachings to be taught, you know, very, very far away in somebody's practice. And I tend to not follow that rule. I like to bring this from, from the get-go because I think it's so juicy and I think we can recognize something in there. Is there some things you recognize a little bit in there? It's like, oh, that deserves a little investigation. I think you don't need to have meditated before to actually look at these. Especially for us, I think, queer folks, you know, self is really something we've looked at. You know, we like Anushka Fernando Pulley often says, you know, we have a big edge. We have, we're, we, you know, we, we're in front of everybody else for that. You know, we've, we know what it is to inquire about self, you know. And so the last thing I'll just mention here is the sense of self, the sense of uh, the, the, not the story of me, not where I'm going or the later me, but the sense of I that um, can attach itself to pretty much anything, you know, like maybe I'll say something that is a little off or has a lack of consideration of our consciousness. And somebody tells me, oh, Pascal, that, that was not very considerate. And then I could make it a self thing, like self-defined, have a sense of self, instead of being able to recognize, yeah, that's true, that was not helpful. Do you see the difference? There's no denial. You know, it's not like, oh, it doesn't count. There can be still an ouch, but it doesn't define self suddenly, you know, um, or anything else, you know, about, uh, you know, it could be body, emotions, this uh, tendency to appropriate. We so much know, you know, the danger of uh, appropriation, appropriating land is, you know, we've seen the damage that uh, colonialism has done and the damage it's doing now in the world. And so in a way, there's something like this that might be happening for us personally, kind of, um, you know, and there's many nuances of course in this, but I think like just thinking of the body, there's something that might be helpful for us to recognize there's something very natural happening here. This is, this is nature, you know, it's elements of nature. When there be death, it will return. All this will return to, you know, dirt. Is it earth, earth? And you know, this in the teaching, it says that the body is a play of the elements. It's fire, digestive fire, it's heat, cold. It's a play of movement, air element, water element. You know, and uh, just at that level, there's something, uh, some level of freedom to be gained for ourselves, I think, to recognize, yeah, it's my body. I decide who touches it and, the, you know, the integrity of the body. And yet, I also understand that this is, this is not mine. You know, this is nature. It belongs to nature. It was created by nature. It totally is an expression of nature. And there will be death and it will continue to be nature. And so uh, just a few ideas about uh, different ways of selfing and uh, you know, disadvantages or the way we can get caught uh, in this way. There's a few minutes and I'd love to hear, you know, nuances, objections, other versions of trouble or the beauty so of uh, the healing and the, of, uh, the sense of self.